Muchas gracias. Voy a hablar acerca de seguridad. Really, this is a talk that's um, breaking breaking some myths. So, looking at things that are commonly held beliefs by some folks, um, perhaps even some of you, uh, myself even in the past, and and looking at the reality behind those. Um, so this is a little bit about me. I'm going to kind of skip over this, um, and uh, and we'll jump right into the meat here. Uh, one thing I do want to kind of point out is this isn't any kind of comprehensive talk on IPv6 security, right? Obviously, we don't have enough time for that, and also um, I'm not a IPv6 security expert, right? These are just things that I've picked up along the way, things that have, I've learned, because um, I believe that when we talk about IPv6, a lot of times many of us who are IPv6 um, enthusiasts or evangelists or, or people who have deployed IPv6 come from a networking background and not necessarily a security background. Um, and so as with many things in networking, the security seems to kind of take a little bit of a back burner sometimes, and I think these are important pieces to look at. So uh, let's, let's bust some myths here. The first one, and, and, and one of the most problematic myths that I run into, and, and one that I think is fairly commonly held by people who um, haven't looked into IPv6 very much yet, is I'm not running IPv6, so it's not a security problem for me. And the reality is that it is already a problem for you because most applications are going to try to use IPv6 by default now. And so if you have uh, a bring your own device environment in your, in your corporate IT where people are out on other networks with their phones or laptops or tablets, uh, they're very likely going to be using IPv6 in some networks in some parts of the world. Um, and also you're going to have IPv6 traffic within your own network on your own LANs with these devices trying to come up and, and do neighbor discovery and talk to each other and, and create IPv6 traffic inside of your network. And then perhaps even a bigger problem is if you're not paying any attention to IPv6 whatsoever and you're only firewalling for IPv4, then it's very likely that your client's devices will set up some kind of automatic tunneling because many of them do this by default, both, both Windows and, and Macintosh devices or Apple devices do this, where they'll tunnel IPv6 inside of IPv4 and of course, if you're not looking for IPv6, you're just going to see an IPv4 packet go through the firewall, and it's probably going to pass through, um, breaking down all of your corporate security policies. The next myth I want to talk about is the one that gets propagated a lot, and this one gets propagated a lot by folks who are IPv6 experts, which is that IPv6 has security built in. Um, and that's somewhat true, but there are, there are some caveats there. So IPsec at this point, is no longer new, right? Once it was developed for IPv6, it was backported to IPv4, and it's been available for a long time. Um, and, and the fact that people aren't using it, I don't know that that changes with IPv6. Um, there are some good things about IPv6's implementation of IPsec. Um, the way the header is structured is a little bit cleaner, may make it a little bit more efficient. And obviously, requiring IPsec as part of the IPv6 stack means that it's at least available to you to use. But, the applications themselves still have to use it. So there's still an active participation, there's an active piece that you have to go out and, and actually use IPsec even though it's there and available for you. Another thing that I think we tend to forget about a little bit is that IPv6, at this point, while we've been you know, changing the protocol and, 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 and moving the protocol along and maturing the protocol over the last you know, couple of dozen years, uh, it, was, it was really designed 15 to 20 years ago where you know, if you look, think about the late 90s and the internet, it was quite a bit different than it is today um, in terms of scale and scope. And so there may be more security risks now than there were at that time. So we need to consider that as we, as we move forward, which is probably why some of these other flaws exist. So one of the big things that's really cool about IPv6 is extension headers. So there's a very small IPv6 um, actual protocol header for the packet. And then for all additional features, there are extension headers, which makes the protocol extremely extensible and, and fairly predictable uh, as far as header sizes. But um, there are some, some caveats there. One of those was the routing header type 0, which luckily has now been deprecated, but there's still a lot of equipment out there that'll, that'll use it and pass it. Um, this is the routing header, um, which basically allows for source routing. And so you're able to, from you know, a client, actually map out the path that the packet will take, which obviously you can build in loops and, and all kinds of fun stuff there, um, and use it for traffic amplification over a remote path, right? So you can, you can send a packet out there to go spin around on somebody else's network, um, potentially generating denial of service traffic, which is why it was deprecated. Um, but again, it's probably a good idea to still filter it out just in case. The hop-by-hop -hop options header uh, is another 
uh, extension header that can cause denial of service attacks. Uh, in this case, very low bandwidth denial of service attacks. There's a draft um, in the IETF that talks about the threat specifically. Um, basically, the hop by hop options header is a header that's supposed to be evaluated by every hop along the path, right? Hence the name. And each device that has to look at this, right, you're talking about some computational power, some, some cycles on the CPU that have to actually go in and look at this packet. Um, and you can have a bunch of them. You can stuff them with all kinds of bad information. Um, and you can, again, you can cause routers basically to use all their computational power to look at these hop by hop option headers rather than forwarding packets and create a fairly low bandwidth, fairly easy to, uh, to project um, denial of service attack against uh, any kind of network infrastructure. And then that kind of leads into the, the problem that extension headers in general are, are vulnerable because of the extensibility. Because you're able to have extension headers for all kinds of different services and, and the protocol is wide open as far as future uses for extension headers, you can pack large extension headers, tons of extension headers, invalid extension headers that don't actually exist yet, and, and cause problems. Again, same kind of things where the routers along the path have to look at those extension headers, have to try to evaluate them, and in some cases can't. And uh, again, denial of service is, is, a, is a big option here, using extension headers potentially. Also, beyond extension headers, um, neighbor discovery is, is inherently trusting. So rogue router advertisements. So router advertisements obviously are, are one of the key pieces of, of getting a IPv6 LAN to work. Um, but if you have a rogue router advertisement, right, router advertisements from something other than the device you want to use as your local network's gateway, then you can renumber hosts. You can um, give a different default route so that you basically create a man in the middle attack. RFC 6104 talks about the problem. Um, and looks at a bunch of, of possible solutions to the problem. Uh, a lot of it is basically local network access, right? So if you, can, if you control the physical access to your local network, both wireless and, and physical ports, then obviously um, no one can get a device onto your network to create rogue RAs. It's really a physical security problem, in this case for the local LAN. Um, and then kind of beyond that, um, for, you know, all the neighbor discovery messages in general are, are somewhat vulnerable. Router advertisement is probably the most powerful, but any neighbor discovery message could be forged and could cause havoc on, on a local network. And of course, ICMP redirects work just like IPv4 redirects, so you can, again, cause havoc with uh, network flows. And then uh, another piece that I think a lot of people forget about is that many of the attacks we actually deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are either above or below the IP layer. Right, so they're not at layer three. So IPv4 versus IPv6 has no effect whatsoever on security. Things such as buffer overflows, um, databases, SQL injections, cross-site cross scripting, um, open relays, spam, email. There's, there's a number of security risks that just don't change when you, when you migrate to IPv6, right? That still need to be mitigated. So IPv6 being inherently more secure than IPv4 in, in a lot of ways is a misnomer. The next myth, um, one of, of my personal uh, favorites, is uh, that not having NAT in IPv6 means less security. Um, this is one that a lot of enterprise folks believe that, that their NAT device is, is a security device. Um, and the fact of the matter is that's just not true. Stateful firewalls provide security. Network address translation is not a security feature. Um, and in fact, in many cases, uh, a network address translation device is uh, a security risk in that it creates a single point of failure into your network. It's a attack surface so that you can eat more easily denial of service someone by knocking over their NAT box instead of having to actually attack the servers themselves. Right? Another great one is that IPv6 networks are too big to scan. Right? We've moved to a place where instead of having a couple of addresses on a local network, you potentially have billions and billions and billions of addresses on every single network that you put up, right? If, as a slash 64 being the smallest network, I think that's about 180 octillion addresses. So uh, there's a huge number of addresses. And so at first glance, this seems like something that might be true. But the reality is that the way we're doing addressing means that you don't really have to scan all of those addresses in most cases, right? So stateless address auto configuration and EUI 64 addresses both use, um, uh, they, oh, sorry, Slack uses EUI64 addresses, right, which is based on your MAC address. 
and um, there's only so many uh, OUIs, right? So each manufacturer has a set prefix for their MAC addresses. And if you search the popular ones, if you want to attack an Apple, right, there's a set number of those. And so you can kind of narrow down the, the amount of addresses that you need to scan by doing that. Um, in many cases, DHCPv6 is going to be handing out addresses sequentially, starting at 1 or 10 or 100 or somewhere. And so if you just scan the low numbers of, an, of a network, you're probably going to find all the hosts in a DHCP network. 6 to 4, ISOTAP, Teredo, all of the kind of automatic tunneling protocols use well-known addresses. So again, there's another little block of addresses you can scan. Most of you, when you go out and manually configure a device, you're going to use a number that you can remember, which also makes it a number that other people can predict and scan. And then, of course, if you are able to exploit a local node, once I get one device, if I'm able to get into one PC, one server, one router, if I have access to a device on your network, then, again, I have all this neighbor discovery at my fingertips, and I can find out the addresses of all the other devices on that local network. Um, and then, of course, there's always the potential problem of addresses being leaked out through things like email, where you're actually sending the address in some kind of plain text message outside of your network, and again, makes it easy to find that device. Um, so you don't even have to scan in those cases. Kind of correlated with that um, is the idea of privacy addresses. So privacy addresses are meant to um, stop people from being able to track you. So again, looking back at the stateless address auto configuration, uh, if you're doing Slack on your device and your device is using its MAC address into that address every time, then basically you're going to be using the same host portion of the address and you're just going to change networks as you move around if you're, if you're mobile. And so you could be tracked, right? So websites, government agencies, um, nefarious folks could potentially track your movement from network to network because you're using your MAC address as your identifier as you go around. So privacy addresses use an MD5 hash to switch that up so that they can't be changed. Um, so it basically creates kind of a random number each time. Some operating systems do it differently. Some do it per session. Some do it over time. Um, but this actually causes security problems, in my opinion, because filtering, troubleshooting, all the forensics you're going to do actually become more difficult on your own network if you're allowing Slack, right? So if you allow Slack and you and devices are doing privacy addresses, you are going to see hosts jumping from address to address, and it's going to be very hard for you to correlate activity on your own network, which of course is the point of privacy addresses. Um, but when you're managing a network, it may not be the best thing. One alternative that I'd like to suggest to folks is looking at like randomized DHCP. There are some implementations out now that'll actually do DHCP addresses in non-sequential order. Um, or at the very least, you can use DHCP and, and not start right at the very beginning of the, of the network. Start at a higher up number. Um, on the host side, you can use randomized IIDs, which basically forces DHCP to give you different addresses. Um, and then on the server side, you can do short leases, randomized assignments. So you can still kind of create privacy for your users while allowing yourself to have forensic um, abilities. Another one, and this one's starting to fade away now that IPv6 is becoming more and more deployed, but a lot of folks still believe that because IPv6 is this new protocol that it's just not going to be attacked. Kind of like, you know, if you go back a few years ago, everyone said, oh, well, you know, apples don't get attacked because nobody, you know, not, nobody has them. Um, and, and that's just not true, right? There are a number of things. Um, in the slides, in the archive, you can click on that THC link. That actually will take you if you want to see this stuff. There's a whole IPv6 attack toolkit. Um, there's port scan tools out there available. There's packet forgery tools. There's analysis service tools. There is a huge amount of uh, basically pre-built scripts and tools for the nefarious person to use against IPv6 specifically already available. A uh, quick Google search will bring you to a lot of them. Um, also, there's, you know, we've already found bugs and vulnerabilities um, from, from multiple vendors as well as in open source software. And so you need to be paying attention to those things, patching your software, making sure your IPv6 stack is up to date so that you're not vulnerable to these things. Um, this securityfocus.com, and then in the URL of the, the BID IPv6, that actually will give you some really cool information um, and some, some neat uh, attack vectors to IPv6, where I recommend if you're interested in, in security and IPv6, take a look. Another myth, and, and this one kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning, which is that most of the folks, I think, who are in, at least initially deploying IPv6 and, and looking at IPv6 and learning about IPv6 and talking about IPv6 are network engineers and not necessarily security guys. 
Um, so on the networking side, 96 more bits, no magic. You go from 32 bits to 128 bits. Routing pretty much works all the same. It's, it's, it's pretty much true, right, for, for routing. Security, not so much. Um, one of the easiest things is that the address format itself is completely different, right? We've changed from 32 bits to 128 bits. We've changed from decimal notation to hexadecimal notation. We've changed from periods to colons. And now we have zero suppression, zero compression. The address can actually look many different ways and still be the same address. And so from a security and forensics perspective, if you're doing logging, if you're trying to grep for addresses, if you're doing filtering on specific addresses, uh, all of that changes, right, from IPv4 to IPv6. Everything's completely different. You, you, know, you don't have the period delimitator anymore, now you have a colon. Um, you're not looking for decimal numbers, you're looking for hexadecimal. So it's, it's actually quite different from a forensics perspective in that the addresses are completely different. So any kind of scripts or you know, security tools you may have built for IPv4 quite possibly need to be you know, redone for IPv6. Also, every host in an IPv6 network has more than one address, which isn't, isn't nearly as common in IPv4. Uh, and so you're going to see the same host potentially in your logs from multiple different addresses. And again, so backtracking that and the forensics aspect of that uh, is potentially difficult. And then again, right, adding IPv6, because IPv6 is basically a new internet protocol, most vendors, most equipment vendors, had to kind of completely start over and they, and they wrote IPv6 code parallel to IPv4 code, and so the syntax is quite a bit different. In a lot of cases better, but definitely different. And so all of your trained engineers probably need more training because the commands are just gonna be a little bit different, right? So it takes some time to get familiar with, which again, I think, you know, is, is a risk all across the board. Um, there's another myth, and this is one that I propagated myself in, in my early days of, of talking about IPv6, which was just configure your IPv6 filters the same as your IPv4 filters. Um, and th but there's some caveats there that are really important, right? DHCPv6 and neighbor discovery both use ICMP. Uh, in IPv4, it's quite common to just block all ICMP. Uh, if you do that in IPv6, your network won't work. So, um, there, there, you know, there's some other things. Looking here, the DHCP message exchange also is using link local addresses, which is something a little bit different. And what I have here is an example firewall filter. This is for a micro tick router. Uh, it's just one example. but. If you go through here, you can kind of see it's, it's a little bit different than what you might do on an IPv4 filter. Um, again, mainly because you're allowing for the DHCPv6 advertisements with the link local addresses. Um, you're also allowing ICMP. And, and there's some things that you need to allow that you wouldn't have been allowing necessarily in IPv4. There's another myth that I get from people I buy services from, people I buy equipment from. And they tell me, yes, it supports IPv6. And in many cases, it, it really doesn't, at least not in the way I need it to, especially from a security perspective in that uh, there's not necessarily feature parity, right? The fact that I can put an IPv6 address on the box doesn't mean that it supports IPv6, right? I need full feature parity with my IPv4 functionality. Um, uh, Wright published a document called Wright 554, which is, again, linked in the slides. Uh, which has detailed requirements that you could potentially use for uh, an RFP or, or, or your own uh, requirements sending out to, you can just kind of copy and paste it into your requirements when, when talking to vendors. It's a, it's a really good document that gives a great basis for the things that need to be required in a, in a device to be fully IPv6 uh, functional. And then, of course, you still want to do your own lab testing um, and, and do independent outside verification, right? Don't trust your vendors at this point. Uh, there's still, you know, it, We've been using IPv4 for, you know, decades, and there's still bugs, right? And we've worked out most of them, but there's still bugs there. So IPv6 being fairly new, there's going to be a lot of bugs. There's going to be missing features, and you need to find those. Um, last one here. There are no IPv6 security best current practices yet, uh, and the fact is there are. Um, here's a few of them. You want to perform IPv6 filtering at the perimeter. Um, you want to do unicast R, R, uh, RPF checks throughout your network, so basically the BCP38. Um, you want to use manual tunnels whenever you can instead of dynamic tunnels. Um, and if you're not, so if once you do that, right, if you're, if you're in control of your own tunneling, then you can block automatic tunnels and, and stop people from basically tunneling through your firewalls with the protocol and protocol tunnels. Um, obviously, we want to use common access network security measures, right? You want to be able to, you know, turn off inactive ports. All, the, all that, that stuff's fairly standard. Um, 
And, and really, one of the big pieces is, again, even though the, the, the filters and the syntax and the addresses, not everything's going to be exactly the same, but you really do want equal protection in IPv6 as in IPv4, right? If you've built up a security policy around IPv4, that the policy itself probably applies to IPv6 equally. Um, and then, of course, continue to let your vendors know what you need, what features you need, what that feature parity means to you, what things you need out of IPv6 that you're using in IPv4 that maybe aren't there yet. Uh, and, of course, then the last myth is that there are no IPv6 security resources. And, of course, there are. Um, a shameless plug, uh, I work at the Internet Society, and uh, Deploy360 actually has a page up uh, specific to IPv6 security. So that's there. There's also a book, um, IPv6 Security. It was published in 2009. That's, that's great. And the U.S. government um, National Institute of Standards and Technology released a guidelines document that's, that's fairly thick but also fairly good. And, of course, search engines are your friend. You can find... Um, a lot of information out there, tons of information. At this point, the, the, the information maturity at least has come up quite a bit, if not the, uh, the protocols themselves. So the, the thing I want to leave you with here, the reality of, of a dual stack network is that you're running two independent protocols. You need two sets of filters, you're going to have two sets of bugs, and you really have to look at it as parallel logical implementations, right? There, there's two completely different protocols and you really have to treat it that way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for Thank your you. presentation. I really enjoy it, and I believe it is good for the audience to hear about. Alguna pregunta? Alguien? Bueno, la audiencia es difícil. No, no, stay here. I, I do have a question, okay. as, as usual. Uh, you said something about the hop by hop uh, header extension, and you said that. It, it is like vulnerable for attacks in low bandwidth links. Is that right? Not just low bandwidth links, but the fact that, so most denial of service attacks are use bandwidth as the way of, uh, many denial of service attacks use bandwidth as an attack, right? You're actually pumping a bunch of bandwidth to someone, which requires that you have bandwidth to get to them. The hop by hop extension headers allows you to do a very low bandwidth attack. So the attack itself is low bandwidth. You can send um, not a lot of traffic and still cause a lot of effect. Okay. And do you have your translator or mm -hmm. not? Okay. Eh, recuerden que pueden hacer la pregunta en español y, y voy a hacer una pregunta más, Chris, referente, de hecho es una pregunta muy similar a la que le hice el día de ayer a, a otro expositor y básicamente es curiosidad sobre tu posición a si la cantidad del encadenamiento del, del extension header puede, debería ser limitada a un número en específico, probablemente una cantidad de bytes en específico. Curiosidad, ¿cuál es tu posición al respecto? Yeah, I, I think that's probably a good idea. Uh, I, I, there's, def, there's been a proposal, um, I think, on that, actually, uh, in the IETF, and we've talked about it actually within the NANOG VCOP group as well. And I, I do think that there's probably some merit there to... Uh, and and the, the way of doing it is where it gets complicated, right? Because you could potentially limit the number of extension headers, but then they could be any size and you could still have problems. Uh, and if you limit the size of each extension header, then you could have a lot of them. So you kind of have to do both. Or maybe there's a maximum you know, header size. With all extension headers combined, maybe we, we put a maximum header size on it. But I think something along those lines probably should be done because what's happening now is a lot of people are just completely blocking extension headers altogether. There's, there's a number of, of networks out there that are just, if anything comes in with any extension headers at all, um, other than maybe a couple, um, like the, the security headers, um, they block it. And so we're basically, if we keep going down the path we're on now, I think we may lose the functionality of extension headers altogether because people will just be filtering them everywhere and we won't be able to use them at all. So limiting the, the size of it and, and reducing that attack uh, vector, I think would be a good idea because then maybe we, more people will allow extension headers and we could use them more. Oh, well, thank you so much for, for, for your response. And I, I, I am more or, more or less in the same side that you. It should be done in somehow. Y tenemos una pregunta en línea. Adelante, nombre, por favor. Uh, buenos días, eh, Octavio Álvarez de GlobalSat. Uh, tenemos que balancear seguridad y también funcionalidad. Eh, tenemos que reemplazar NAT con Stateful Firewall. La pregunta es si tenemos protocolos o mecanismos 
para poder conectar un dispositivo y que automáticamente podamos eh, negociar con el firewall qué puertos necesitamos de entrada, por ejemplo, un teléfono que necesite puertos abiertos o aún tenemos que configurar puertos manualmente en los routers o hay algo que se puede hacer eh, con IPv6 o algún nuevo protocolo o algo de eso. So that's another, that, that, that's an issue that again kind of goes one step above um, IP layer, right? Because we're talking about ports, which comes into TCP or UDP, which is a little bit above. So it, it shouldn't be that different between IPv6 and IPv4. I think in reality it is a little bit. Um, there are protocols like the UPnP um, IGD, which is Internet Gateway Device, I think, but that allows, there is a UPnP protocol that allows communication between hosts and routers to open up ports on a firewall. And there's new work, right, in uh, the PCP, the port control protocol. I don't know how widely adopted it is yet. It seems fairly low, but there are protocols available to do that, yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por la pregunta y por la respuesta también. Creo que con esto podemos proceder a la siguiente presentación. Thank you so much, Chris, for your presentation. One more time. We expect to see you in other LACNIC events. Thank you so much. Un aplauso. Thank you.